open up to the book of John, chapter 14, and we're going to uh, pick up where we left off last week. We've been talking about over the last several weeks, or I wasn't here last week, but over the last several weeks, we've been talking about the function of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. In, in each of our lives, the Holy Spirit has a responsibility, has a function. Jesus called him the helper. He said that I will go to the Father, and he said, and he will send a helper to you, John 14, verse uh, uh, 26. He says, I will send to you, or verse 16, rather, I will send to you the helper, and he will be with you, and he will be in you. And so we recognize that we've said some things in the past, in, in the last few weeks, that he's a gentleman. He is not going to invade your life. He is not going to in, uh, 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 commandeer your life. He has to be invited in, and, and once you invite him in, he will stay in and he will guide you. It's our choice whether we're going to resist him or we're going to welcome him. We have the choice of rolling out the welcome mat or pulling it in. And if we welcome him in, then we have the choice of, of interacting with him or grieving him. We can interact with him and entertain him, or we can resist him and grieve him. And so that's our choice. He's not going to invade our life. He's not going to force himself upon us. He's going to do just those things. And when we allow him to come in and when we interact with him, and we yield to his directions for our life, then we'll find that he will do exactly what he said, what Jesus said he would do in the scriptures. He would function that way in our life. In other words, he can be our teacher. He can be our guide. He can be our comforter. He can be our strengthener. He can be our reminder. He can be the equipper. He can be the counselor. And praise the Lord, he can be our prayer partner. And he'll always pray according to, and he'll always help us pray according to God's will. So the Holy Ghost wants to work in your life, wants to function in your life. We saw in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14 that he is the seal, that we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that simply means that we have been uh, stamped, we have been uh, sealed and he applies for security. He is, it's, it's, it's applicable to security in our life. It's authenticity in our life. And it's protection. And I like this particular one. He is, uh, makes us authentic believers. And that he will uh, protect us from the contamination of our culture. Recognize that we walk through this earth, we walk through the world, but yet we're not supposed to be of the world. But too often, culture begins to contaminate our belief, our belief system, begins to contaminate our mind, and begins to contaminate our lives. And so the Holy Spirit allows us and equips us to live a life of love, to live a life of holiness, and to live a life of power. And uh, His grace is what equips us and strengthens us to overcome the challenges and the difficulties in life. What we have seen to this point has been the Holy Spirit's function within the heart of the believer. And we recognize as we read the Scriptures that the Holy Spirit not only works within the life of the believer, within his heart, but he also works upon him. And so there's two facets of the Holy Spirit's ministry or function is that he's going to work within your life, but he's going to work through your life and upon your life. And so he is upon us at various seasons and various times. And so this morning, we're going to look at some things that he will do for us or do through us and upon us if we're yielded to him. Amen? The first thing is that he is, he is on the inside of us. We recognize, and when you see the, the, the four little words, the Spirit of the Lord, the hand of the Lord, or the Spirit of God, either the Old Testament or the New Testament, you'll find out that what he's talking about is God's anointing upon an individual. 
Now, when we look at the Old Testament, we find out there were certain men who were anointed by God for a specific season, a specific function, or a specific time. Uh, the prophets, the priests, and the kings were anointed by God for sometimes spiritual, sometimes natural, and sometimes political things in their life. And so they were anointed for a particular season. And so we're going to look at some of those things today. In the book of Judges especially, uh, we, we, we talked about Gideon with Mr. Price, but recognize that in the book of Judges, now when we understand the book of Judges, it's not the guys in the black robe standing behind a desk or sitting behind a, a, um, a counter and, and with a gavel in his hand. And so when he talks about the judges or a per certain person judged Israel, it wasn't that they were pronouncing them guilty or innocent. God is our judge. But what they were doing is they were the deliverers. They were the redeemers. They were the ones when the people cried out because of their sin, God had removed protection from them. And all of a sudden they were attacked by enemies. They were attacked uh, in various ways. And they cried out to God. God God sent them a man, anointed him for that season, anointed him for that, that particular time uh, with the Holy Ghost so that he could be a, a warrior, he could be a deliverer, he could be a defender, he could be a fighter, he could be one that would deliver Israel from their oppression, and then they would turn back to God because they had cried out to him, and then he would deliver Israel, and most of the time you never heard from him again. Because he, that was just a seasonal thing. And so we see that over and over again. The first one in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 3, was a man by the name of Othaniel. Othaniel was, happens to be Caleb's younger brother's son. Uh, Othaniel was, was uh, Caleb's nephew. You remember Caleb? Caleb was the guy who, and, and, and him and Joshua were the only two men who entered into the promised land that were over 40 years old. The word says because they had a different spirit. They had a different attitude within them. They were men of faith. And at 80 years old, Caleb went to Joshua and said, listen, we've gone into the promised land now. Give me this mountain because I'm 80. I, my eyes are still strong. I am as strong today as I was when I was 40. Now, I don't know how many of us can say that. But that's what he said. And I believe that some of the spirit of, of Caleb uh, fa fell upon this young man by the name of Othaniel. And it says that he attacked uh, the, uh, the king of Mesopotamia. I'm not going to try to read the man's name, but it was the king of Mesopotamia. And he said, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. In other words, he delivered Israel. Judges chapter 6, God sent a man, uh, sent an angel to a man that was hiding in a cave, Threshing, threaded, threshing out wheat, and, and, and you'd say that he was probably had a, a yellow streak down his back a mile wide. His name was Gideon, and the, the angel of the Lord appro approached him and said, Oh, ye mighty man of valor. The guy's hiding in a cave. He is not one that wants to get out and fight. He's trying to avoid the battle. He's trying, to he's trying to avoid conflict. And yet the Lord saw there was something about him. And it says, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he blew a trumpet. <laughs> Boy, I'm waiting for God to, the Spirit of God to fall on me, and I can sing. I don't think it'll happen. But he blew the trumpet, simply gave out a prophetic call, and that prophetic call drew all of Israel, and they went to battle, and he was successful in battle. Four times in the book of Judges do we hear the same words spoken over a man by the name of Samson, and he did mighty feats. Why do I bring that out? Because, see, there's times in our lives where the anointing has to be more than just what's on the inside. 
There's seasons in our life, there's circumstances in our life or our family where the Spirit of God wants to come upon an individual for that season or that time in your life. It may be a time of, of, of deep financial difficulty. It might be a time of deep uh, emotional distress. It might be a time when you just don't know that you can make it one more day, but you got to know that the Spirit of God not only lives in you, but He wants to anoint you for that season and that time in your life to overcome that circumstance and that situation. And sometimes it's not just for you, but it's for someone else where the Spirit of God comes upon you. And so there are seasons where the Spirit of God will give you. And, and when we look at these, what we're, what we're looking at is the actual manifestations of the Spirit that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When he talks about the gifts of the Spirit, some of these are the manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit because it's the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon an individual to accomplish a task, to do something at that particular moment. It is as the Spirit wills. See, sometimes the Spirit of God comes upon an individual for a, to give them a word in due season. To give them a word of encouragement, a word to, to help someone through a difficult time, a difficult season. David said in his last, the last few words in 2 Samuel, he says, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and the Word of God was on my tongue. I can't tell you how many times through the years of ministry where the, where the Spirit of God spoke to someone. And those words were just what I needed at that moment. A number of years ago, there was a lady in our church who uh, the Lord had spoken to her, and she failed to give that word to us. And, and so a couple of days later, she pinned the words down. And, and, and she asked the Lord to repeat it, so she pinned the words down. And they were for me, some specific things for me. And so I just recently uh, was blessed and was able to purchase some new uh, desk and shelving units. Up until this point, I've been using either some tables or some hand-me-up desk. Anybody uses hand-me-ups? You know, we always talk about hand-me-downs from one child to the next. Well, my kids have given me stuff. I, I, I wear some hand-me-up shirts, you know, from my daughter. And this was a hand-me-up desk. And, and so I finally got rid of that, sold it, and bought some new. And so I was reorganizing my desk and reorganizing my office. And, you know, sometimes you just have to do that. And I found this little piece of paper was folded over about six or seven times. And it, had, it, it was just laying it was with a bunch of other stuff. And I, and I said, well, what's this? You know, so I opened it up, and it was that word. That word, I don't know the date that it was actually written, but it's probably 10 or 12 years old. And that word from God at that moment was important. But I'm telling you, that word from God today or, or yesterday when I found it was more valuable to me than it was that many years ago. And so sometimes the Spirit of God comes upon an individual and you'll have a word in due season for somebody. It's an anointing for that time, that, that particular moment. And sometimes that's called a word of knowledge or it's called a word of wisdom where you speak into somebody's life. You may not recognize how important the words that you have for someone might be because you don't know how, what they're going through. But when the Spirit of God tells you, call someone, do something, uh, give them this word, tell them that I love them. You just don't know what the Spirit of God has in store and the blessing that you're going to be for someone else. You know, th there's a, a story in the Old Testament, Second Chronicles chapter 20, and you know, we know the end of the story. You know, Jehoshaphat was being, and the people of Judah and Jerusalem were being attacked by uh, Moab and uh, Mount Seir and Ammon, and you know, they got together and there was a big battle and there was fear, and Jehoshaphat calls a fast, and, and they just praised God, and here was this young man, a son of one of the prophets by the name of Jehaziel, and 
and Jehaziel, let's see, I'll make sure that's the one, yeah, Jehaziel uh, has a word for them. He said, you don't need to fight in this battle. Just position yourself and stand still and see the salvation of God. What a word in due season. What a word for the, for the nation of Israel that they're being attacked. And he says, you know, Jehoshaphat says, you know, I don't know what we're going to do, but our eyes are on you. And sometimes you don't know what's going on in the circumstances in somebody else's life, but you can be that Jehaziel for someone that says you don't need to fight in this battle because God is on your side. And stand still and know that God is going to cause this battle to come to, come to pass, and you will see his victory because God, listen, he could have said all of that, but those last little words that said God is with you are so valuable for some, someone that you're going through a difficulty, going through a circumstance. And you know how, I don't know about you, but I look at people and everybody wears a facade. Everybody, you, know, you ask somebody, how's it going? Oh, it's going good. Going great. But they're hiding something. 90% of people are hiding something. It ain't all that good. And yet there's sometimes where we, we put that up. But the Spirit of God, will, you might not know what they're going through. You might not know the challenges that they're facing. Because they're not going to want, they, most of the time they're not going to share. But sometimes the Spirit of God, what am I talking about? Spirit of God come upon an individual. It's the Spirit upon you to speak into their lives. And sometimes the Spirit of God will just tell you, listen. Just encourage that person. I can't tell you how many times I, I've just, you know, somebody's on my heart. And I'll get my phone out and I'll just call them. I'm just, just thinking about you. Just, just want to let you know you were on my mind. Don't know if there's anything going on, but I'm praying for you. And just want to let you know that I love you. And that God loves you. And then they just break down on the other side. Because, you know, I just, I just needed to hear those words. It wasn't anything great. It wasn't any, thus said the Lord, you got a million dollars coming in. Thus said the Lord, you got a new job coming in. Thus said the Lord. It was just say, I, you would, I was just on your mind. You were on my mind. I get it right. You, you, were, you were just on my mind. And it's amazing. People say, you, you were thinking about me? And you took the effort. Now it's easy. You know, you can just text somebody. I do that a lot. You know, just text them. Say, just thinking about you. And I get a, get a response back, thank you. I needed to know that you were, were that, I, that God had put me on your heart. And sometimes it's just a word in due season. Sometimes the Lord gives us wisdom at a given moment in a good, certain circumstance, a, a time in our life when we, we're, 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 we've, we've gone through the maze of life and we find ourselves not knowing where the end of the maze is. You know, we've got a maze read, set for the little kids on, on, on Tuesday night, you know, so they can walk through. And so sometimes, you know, we find life is a maze. You go in this direction and you bump up against something. So you turn around, you go and you bump up against something and you keep going it just seemed like you're not happy and it's just not happening and so God gives you wisdom at that moment at that given time a man like that in the book of uh, Genesis a man by the name of Joseph Joseph was uh, was such a man that God had given him a dream an anchor for his soul a word at that time a and Joseph found himself in a pit then he found himself in prison then he found himself even in worse circumstances than he ever imagined whatever happened and yet the the word kept coming to him that that you're gonna you're gonna come out of here uh, you, you keep hold of that dream and all of a sudden he was able to uh, interpret Pharaoh's dream and because he could interpret Pharaoh's dream God promoted him out of the dungeon of prison and promoted him to be second in charge sometimes the Spirit of God gives you wisdom in circumstances that you don't know necessarily what to do or how to get out of it, but you know you can yield to the Holy Spirit and He will give you wisdom in that season, in that time of your life. In Exodus chapter 31, Moses is in the process of building the tabernacle. 
And the tabernacle, when you read it and you study all of the, all of the colors and all of the materials and everything that was put into the tabernacle, all pointed to Jesus, all pointed to redemption. It all pointed to, to the New Testament. And Moses put this, I'll tell you, Moses was not that smart to be able to put all this thing together. And you know, the word says at the end of the book of Exodus that Moses built the tabernacle. Moses didn't uh, sew the first stitch. Moses didn't hammer out the first piece of gold. He didn't do the first piece of first stick because there was a man in Genesis, I'm in uh, Exodus 31, by the name of Bezalel. And the word says that the Spirit of God was upon Bezalel in all manner of workmanship. And Bezalel and Eloiab were the two men that were in charge of all of the workmanship. And he says they, were, they did it because of the anointing of the Spirit of God upon them. And so I tell you, business owners, the guy, the, the Lord can bring you anointed men, anointed workers, anointed people who can do exactly what you need for them to do, and they will have your best interest at heart. You're going to profit because of their anointing and God's anointing upon you. And so Moses gets credit. You know, people look at this building and say, boy, you did a good job building this building. I didn't turn the first bolt. I didn't climb on that corner, although I wanted to, and, and, and run some of those panels down here. I didn't do any of that. Jeremy did. Uh, I, 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 but, you know, people give me credit for building this building. You know, we've got the responsibility to pay for it now, but uh, I didn't build any of it. And just like Moses didn't, but he got the credit for building it. Why? Because God attaches, God anoints men and women with talent, with, with abilities to do what, th what he's called them to do and to put their part in the body of Christ and to build the kingdom of heaven. And so you've got to realize in Luke chapter 24, the word says that we would be endued with power from on high. That's what Jesus said. Wait in Jerusalem. Wait here until you are endued, until you are anointed with power from on high to fulfill the task, the plan, the endeavor that God has in store for you. To be endued means to be clothed, to be arrayed, to be anointed, to have his ability painted upon you and smeared upon you and, and draped upon you, his ability for your life, not your talent. And, and he takes your talent and accents your talent, and he multiplies your talent, your callings and your giftings, and he enhances those things. And and so I like to say it this way. God takes his super and places it on our natural, and he makes us supernatural. Amen? And so it makes us capable of doing things that we would not be able to do by ourselves or on ourselves. I know one, one, circumstance, one situation in the Old Testament was Elisha, Elijah, rather. And he had just destroyed 400 prophets of Baal. And they hadn't rained in three years, and he sent uh, his his man to look out uh, over the over the the uh, uh, horizon and see if he saw anything. And after seven times, he came back. He said, "I see the cloud about the size of a man's hand." And he said, he told Ahab the king at the time. He said, "Get yourself going back to the to the castle to the to the." Uh, 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 to, to, your, to your house because it's fixing the rain, uh, and, and there's going to be a, an abundance of rain. And the Word says that he girded up his loins, and he outran the chariot. Whew. I don't know about you, but he outran two, at least two horses, uh, and, and that's, that's pretty good. Amen? And so it was for that season. Now, I'm not telling you that you're going to be able to outrun some horses, but I'm telling you this, when the Holy Ghost comes on you, that you will be able to do some things you would not be able to do just with your natural ability and natural talent. 
And there's some times when the Spirit of God comes upon an individual that encourages them and helps them and causes them to be more than they could be without the Holy Spirit. Amen? I'm not sure what the purpose of him outrunning the chariots was. I'm not sure what that purpose was other than God showing us that I can do some things in the human body. I can cause the human body to do some things that it would not be able to do otherwise. Amen? And so I believe that God will do that for us. Hallelujah. And so when we look at Jesus, he makes the statement in Luke chapter 4. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to proclaim, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's what Jesus' ministry was. That's what he was anointed to do. But now listen, when you go back to the book of John, and Jesus makes this statement, John chapter 14, verse 12, he says, the works I do you will do also. And so that means that we ought to be proclaiming the good news to the, to the poor. We ought to be setting captives free. We ought to be proclaiming uh, the acceptable year of the Lord. We ought to be doing those things. But then he says, and the things I do, you'll do greater than the thing, because I, I go to the Father. And then later he says, because I go to the Father, he'll send you the Holy Spirit. You see, we're supposed to function in the function that Jesus did. We're supposed to be Jesus on, in the body of Christ. We're supposed to be uh, uh, identifying, not only identifying with Jesus and being Christians, but we're supposed to be doing the same things Jesus did. Amen. And so there's going to be seasons. I don't mean that, you know, you're going to you're necessarily going to walk on water, but there's going to be some challenges that, that, that come across our lives. But then only the Holy Spirit can assist us in those difficulties, in those in those challenges. But guess what? I've got to be yielded to him. Acts chapter one says that I'm going to be his witness. I'm going to be the, I am going to be a witness to Jesus. And so sometimes, you know, we think, well, I've just got to start passing our tracks to be a witness. No, that means that you're going to have the power and the capacity and the endowment upon you to testify of what Jesus has done in your life. You're going to be able to testify that you have a, a personal knowledge of who Jesus is. You're going to have the words in due season. You know, you don't have to just prepare all this stuff ahead of time and look for it. You just have to be available when the Holy Spirit says, I want you to talk to this person. I want you to share Jesus with this person. I want you to ask this person. Not too long ago, I was, uh, gosh, where was I? Um, I, 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 don't, I don't remember exactly where I was, but I heard these words. And there was a, uh, uh, an African-American man there, and, and I just said, uh, let me ask you something. I said, do you know that Jesus loves you? And he looked at me startled. And he said, well, yes, I do. And he proceeded to pull a cross out of his shirt. And I said, well, why is that in the shirt? <laughs> well, he said, because Jesus stays close to my heart. And he proceeded to show me the Our Father written on the back of the cross. And, you know, we just shared just for a, a brief minute about how God loved him and how God loved me and what God had done in his life and what God had done in my life. And, you know, just an encouragement to him and an encouragement to me that sometimes the Spirit of God will have you to witness what he's done for you, but sometimes it's just to reaffirm that God knows who you are and he's right there for you and he will help you uh, to, to be that witness. And so sometimes the Spirit of God will ask you, he'll be able to testify what experiences you've had with the Spirit of God. Amen? And so we recognize 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Our faces then are not covered. 
they, are, they all show the Lord's glory, and we are being changed to be like Him. This is the New Century Version. This change is in us brings even ever greater glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so what does that verse tell us? That verse tells us simply this, that where I am is not the finished product. Where I am and who I am and what I'm accomplishing and what I'm doing is not the finished product. That God is continually working in us, continually changing us so that we can be more like Him. And it's from glory to glory. And I'm, I'm in, I'm, you and I are walking in one level of glory, one level of function, and it's going to be because there is a partnership between you and the Holy Spirit. He's going to change us, perhaps ever so slightly, but He's going to change us little bit by little bit, a little bit here and a little bit there. He's going to change us to be more like Jesus so that I can, I can do whatever I want to do. No, so that I can function the way Jesus functioned on planet earth. I can walk in love. I can walk with that healing anointing. I can walk in that, in that capacity to touch lives, to, to restore hope, and to heal lives. I can do that because of a partnership with the Holy Spirit. Paul prayed this prayer for the, for the Corinthian church in the last uh, verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 14 or 13, rather, he says that the, 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 the peace of God and the love of God be with you. But then he says something. He said, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. When I got to thinking about that, what's he, what's he saying? That, that we would just, you know, we're going to share communion in, in just a little bit. He wasn't talking about the Last Supper. He wasn't talking about uh, that that's what we'll do when the Holy Spirit. What he was talking about is that there is an intimate relationship and a partnership that you and I have with the Holy Spirit in our life. And a partnership is, I mean, how many of you have ever been in a partnership with someone? Uh, husbands and wives, you're in a partnership. But, but when you're thinking about a partnership, and I, I like to think about a partnership in a, in a form of business. My dad and I had a partnership. Dad was in charge of the, the field work. He was in charge of the equipment. He was in charge of uh, making sure the jobs ran fine. I was in charge of the, uh, of the sales, and I was in charge of the books. I was in charge to be sure that the bills were paid on time and that all of that was taken care of. And that there was a slight overlap in, in our partnership. There was a slight overlap because I'd always inform him of where the bills were and, and how much money we had and, and all of that. And he'd always inform me of what other equipment we needed or other supplies we needed, and so there was a small overlap. But for the most part, if I did my job and he did his job, our company was good. Amen? Now, if I failed to do my job and, or he failed to do his job, then there was a lack in there. So I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit will not do your job. And you can't do his job. But if you will yield to him, and you'll recognize him, and you'll, you'll entertain him, and you'll engage him, and you'll yield to him, then he will do his job, and you do your job. And I tell you, there's a, there's a supernatural result. I like the way Pastor Hagen says it. It's the natural and the supernatural that comes together and forms an explosive force for God. There's a partnership that Jesus wants us to have with the Holy Holy Spirit. He lives on the inside of you, but he also wants to come upon you. Why? Because he wants you to have popularity and power? No, because he wants the growth of the kingdom of heaven. I believe this whole thing is wrapping up. I believe that it's not many more years before God's fixing to wrap this whole thing up. I believe he's fixing to send Jesus back. I believe that it's not, there's not a lot of time left. I, I heard one man, minister say this. He said, you know, we've, we've basically run out of time. 
and there's only a sliver of time left. And in that sliver of time, God wants to anoint churches. He wants to anoint individuals to get out and proclaim the good news of the gospel. And he wants us to proclaim that good news so that we can get as many into the kingdom as, as, as possible. Because God is not willing that any should perish. And so I believe that that's imperative that we hook up with the partnership, not only for our benefit. Yeah, there'll be a benefit to you and I because we hook up, but I believe the benefit is to the body of Christ. The benefit is not just to fill this church up, but to fill up heaven. Amen? And so that's, that's why we're here. That's why the, the, the function and the partnership and the, the communion of the Holy Spirit is, is necessary in our lives. Now, this morning, as we, as we share communion, in fact, um, Mr. George, where's Mr. George? Would you go get the children, tell them to, to come on in? As we share communion, this has always been for me a, 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 a time of, of dedication. It's a time of of making a decision. It's a time where Jesus sat with his 12 disciples and he knew that his, his time on the cross was, was just a few hours away.